25 minutes. Last year we had a major storm come in and I got it all done in about a half hour. I don't think we're going to have to go that fast today, but we'll see how rain we get. Okay, we're going to start down here. There's a stone down there that says, In memory of Lawrence Grimes and Wilbur Grimes, buried in Belgium. Lawrence and Wilbur and John were three Grimes brothers. They lived out by Deersville Ridge. They had, uh, they were in World War II, and uh, they were all in different units. John was with Patton. John was injured in early October, and his mother got a telegram. And the telegram says, they always started out, we beg to inform. So when you read those first three words, you didn't know if it was going to say, we beg to inform you, your son's been injured, your son's been captured, your son's been missing, or your son's been killed. So, and typically, it would take a week, even two weeks, for these telegraphs to get, get home because, you know, these were frontline guys, etc. So John got injured, and uh, he wrote a letter home his thank you for being his letter. And the letter says, he said to his mother, I had the scariest night of my life. I got stuck behind lines and I was surrounded by Germans and the only thing that saved me was our tanks attack. He said it was dark and I was hiding in the corner of a fruit cellar and I avoided being captured. So this is mid-October. October 26th, uh, Wilbur writes home. I might have this back, Bert, words, but Wilbur, I think it's Wilbur writes home and asks, it says to his mother, gee, I'm wondering what Bun's doing. I haven't heard from him. Wilbur was in the Italian campaign. If you know anything about World War II, they thought they were kind of going to march up Italy, and they certainly marched up Italy, but it was slow. The Germans fought every single mountain range, and these guys fought for months and months and months. So Lawrence said, I, wished, I really wish I could hear from Bunn. I haven't heard from him. Little did he know, Bunn was killed that day. Bon had, he was at, on Omaha Beach and D-Day in June 6th. Just like his brother in Italy, it was a pincher movement, north, south. They fought their way in, and they got up to the German line in the operation they were in. They got ahead of everybody else, and they got surrounded. And they, we lost 56 men that day. And one of those was Wilbur Grimes. Wilbur, um, he was a half-track driver. But a couple days after that, Lawrence is after 90 days of continuous combat, he was leaning against the building, waiting to be picked up for uh, two weeks of R&R &R at an Italian spa. They, you know, have hot, hot spring spas and stuff. And we know this because he wrote his mother. And he was waiting to be picked up by an Italian spa. And he did to go to the spa. And he had three other people from Harrison County there. Reed Hosterman, Wesley Case, and Donald Porter. None of which, none of these guys are buried here. They're all buried in Belgium. And... The building he was resting against got hit by a mortar. So, five, two days later, he dictated a letter to his mother through a preacher, and the letter said, you told me not to stop any bullets, and I managed to not stop any bullets, although I did stop a brick wall. He says, I'm able to drink, I can't sit up, I'm really sore, but, and this was, it was 
He said, Thanksgiving's coming up, and I'm very thankful to be alive. And he died two days later. So fast forward to 2013, and I get an email from a guy in, in the Netherlands. Wanted to know if there was anybody related to Wilbur Grimes who was still alive. So I looked up his obituary, and there was a name in there, Mary Sims. I had a client. Mr. Sims, so I called him. Hey, Mr. Sims, do you know anything about Wilbur Grimes? He said, yeah. He said, those were my uncles. He said, I was at my grandmother's house the day she got the telegraph. I said, really? He said, yes. I said, man? He said, I'm too young to remember. He said, I, I was too young to remember. He said, but I could tell you it was really bad. Because she received a telegram that said, Wilbur has died. Five days later, she re received a telegram that said, Lawrence is injured. Five days after that, she received a telegram that said, Lawrence has died. So she had five, we beg to inform telegrams in four weeks. One of the things about that war that is different than the wars we fight these days is the amount of shared grief. All those men from Harrison County died that day. The only one that lived, and he only lived five days, was the Grimes brother. So there was a lot of shared grief. It was a, a whole society type situation. So they did, and you'll see these stones occasionally like this where they put a memorial up, even though the people were actually in the Netherlands. So the guy in the Netherlands contacted me because his daughter adopted those two graves. The, Nether the people in the Netherlands still take care of those American graves. And he just wanted to know, he wanted these guys' relatives to know that they were taken care of. So when they left, they had three younger brothers, one of whom is buried right here. He died in 1949. He rolled a tractor over on himself and died. The other two were little. They didn't even remember their brothers. But they were still alive when I started writing this story. Now, to top it all off, uh, Bun, the one that died in the half track, he had a son. It was born in August, and he did not find out until five days before he died. That's when the letter finally caught up with him. His son was passed away before I, his son and wife were both passed away when I wrote this story. So our first two stories are Wilbur and Lawrence Grimes. And that's it. So we're going to, here's the general plan. We're going up to John Bingham. Anybody has walking issues, you can just stay on the road. Then we're going to go back. It's kind of military heavy today, mostly because they're easy stories to do. I don't, they don't require a lot of research because I know them already. So we're going to go ahead and we'll walk up to John A. Bingham. And he's up there at those two tall trees.
I was warned by my wife that I was not to start talking. So everybody made it up from the last talk. He says, I get to talking too quick and people aren't ready. And she gave me really good advice. Okay. And we are, you know, Jimmy Dowdle, who's a, he's the groundskeeper. He, a, he took some pictures for me, but he also he's, he's got this cemetery looking really good for this tour, so we certainly appreciate that. So John Bingham. I mean, everybody here has heard the name. John Bingham, there's a statue. You know, why is there a statue to this guy up there? So John Bingham was born in Mercer County, Pennsylvania in 1815. His mother died when he was young. His father remarried. He couldn't get along with his stepmother. So he moved to his uncle's in Caddis. His uncle had a daughter named Amanda. John, as he reached young adulthood, which at the time would have been 16 or 17, went back to Mercer, went to college, came back, went to uh, Franklin College in, in New Athens, and he read for he read to be an attorney. So what read to be an attorney is there's only one state in the nation that still permits this, Vermont. So you do not need any formal training. You need to work with an attorney, learn the business, take the test, and if you pass it, you're an attorney. That's how they all did it. Not not all, because there were law schools, but not very many back in 1830. So that, that's the way they did veterinary medicine until uh, 1912 in Ohio. You had to have a veterinary degree before that. You, you could just read for it. So anyhow, John Bingham comes back, becomes an attorney, and he marries his cousin Amanda. Remember, he grew up with her. So even though when we got married and got our marriage license in Harrison County. They made us sign an affidavit that we were not first cousin. <laughs> Back in the day, that was not unusual. Okay? As crazy as that sounds to modern ears, that happened all the time. So, he married his cousin. He, his father and uncle were both abolitionists. He became a vocal abolitionist. And that's actually the quote they have on the statue is a, a famous uh, speech he gave in, in the early 1850s at a Whig convention about no more slave states, et cetera, et cetera. He was known in Congress as an outstanding orator and uh, was, it was very good at presenting his arguments. So we... Constitutional scholars consider two eras in this country. The Constitutional Era, the Bill of Rights Era, which was by Madison. Madison wrote our Bill of Rights. We, we kind of know some of them. Well, we all know the right to bear arms, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, etc. Those were federal. And you, for example, if you talked about abolition in South Carolina, you could be sent to prison. There was no freedom of speech. That did not apply to states. That only applied to federal law. So what happened when John Bingham wrote the, the what's called the Due Process Clause, which I wrote it down here for you on the front, of the 14th Amendment, that changed that. They consider... Uh, John Bingham, there were a couple other congressmen, they called them the second founding fathers. So in constitutional law, John Bingham is very well known. Marriage equality, that's 14th Amendment. Racial equality, that's 14th Amendment. Uh, 14th Amendment, natural born citizenship, that's 14th Amendment. They had to figure out a way to make slaves citizens. So that's when somebody's in this country, and they're born in this country, they're a citizen, that's 14th Amendment. Fully 60% of the cases that come up in front of the Supreme Court currently 
involve the 14th Amendment. And they all involve the Due Process Clause. So John Bingham affects our life every single day. And he really, outside of constitutional law, nobody knows him. Now you know him. He's very important. He is either vilified or revered, depending on which way you're arguing at the Supreme Court. But at any rate, why he's so important is the original first part of the 14th Amendment, 14th Amendment was uh, nothing like what he proposed. He wrote it all himself. He argued for it himself. He got it changed himself. And it is literally used every day somewhere in this country in a courthouse, in a court of law. So we see him as a statue. They got an abolitionist quote, but realistically, he is considered a second founding father. And that's, his biography is called John Bingham, a second founding father. So he got unelected because of redistricting. <laughs> so if you guys think this redistricting stuff started today, you would be wrong. So he got, this, this, this area got redistricted. He was a Republican, started out a Whig, became a Republican. He got unelected. He got appointed to be um, minister to Japan. He is revered in Japan. He was a minister for 12 years. And... In the late 1850s, Japan was a closed society, and, you know, Manifest Destiny and all that stuff, England, uh, France, U.S., everybody wanted to trade with Japan. They wanted what Japan had, or they wanted Japan to buy what they had. Japan was a feudal system, and they had no interest. So there was a war, which wasn't really much of a war, because we had cannons, they didn't, et cetera, et cetera. It lasted like five days, and when this war was over, war was over, uh, the great powers, which what they called themselves, by the way, um, levied very punitive damages against Japan. Essentially, they hobbled them with so much debt to pay for this war that was started not by Japan, but by us and England, etc., that Japan could never get out from under this debt. John Bingham goes to minister to Japan. Remember that John Bingham has been an abolitionist his whole life. He became a friend with Titus Bassfield, who was the first black man to graduate from a college in Ohio at New Athens. He invited a black man to be his secretary, a guy named um, Henry Lucas. And Henry wasn't there. And Bingham stopped by and said to his mom, I'm leaving for Japan. This was just, this was post-war. Lucas was in Virginia teaching at a Freedman school. And his mother never heard of Japan and was too scared to tell him because she never heard of Japan. She didn't know where Japan was. So had, had, had his mother told him he would have been the first head secretary as a black man in the 1870s. So John Bingham was very egalitarian, and he treated the Japanese very uh, generously. He got all their debt removed from the United States. After he did that, Europe followed suit. He treated them as equals. There is a large monument and several biographies of him written in Japanese, and he is very much revered. So he had a very distinguished career, and like many people back in that day, you know, re he, he outlived his retirement, basically. There's no Social Security, no nothing, and he basically died pretty poor because he just outlived his ability to pay for himself. He lived to be 85 years old. His house is... is uh, uh, I forget the name of that church. Right by the old bank building was just tore down. Huh? By the family dollar, just no longer. That's where his house stood. So John Bingham 
is more than a statue. He's argued every single, uh, not every single case, but over half the cases in front of the Supreme Court will have the due process clause. And he was from good old cat. Okay. We're going to walk a little ways down. we got a little a dead spot here, so we're going to walk around the turn and see if he gets on the set. <laughs> Sent us the library bat signal and they came and they brought us more handouts. So if you didn't get a handout, stop by and, add, and Carly will give you one on the way by. Thanks. Okay, so we're just going to walk down here and uh, you guys can stay up towards the, I might even stay up towards the, the thing. So. I only, I'm going to talk and walk, but I only covered the highlights of, of Bingham's career. He, he did, he was uh, one of the attorneys for Lincoln's uh, assass, assassin. He was uh, the lead prosecutor for Andrew Johnson's impeachment. He did lots of things, but only one of those has any effect uh, today, and that's the due process. So, he did appoint Custer to West Point, and that's an interesting story. So, Custer was a real ladies' man, and he was after this uh, young lady. What was her name? Molly Holland. Molly Holland's father was a big supporter of Bingham, and to get rid of Custer, he had Bingham appoint him to West Point. Now, we got a Custer guy here. I'm not sure if that's all true or not, but that's what the story says. He wanted Custer out of Harrison County, so he sent him to the military. We're getting a few sprinkles, hopefully it'll hold off. Right, speaker's not waterproof. I'm not going to melt. Sandy's not concerned about me. <laughs> she is concerned. She doesn't care about my chronic cough. <laughs> <laughs> so, I we're standing at, on the black line. From here, all the way around, is black. This cemetery is not an integrated cemetery. Now, the newer section is, but the old section isn't. So, basically, right here, the leaves are black, and it goes all the way around. And even though it looks like there's nobody buried there, the cemetery records tell us there's people buried almost everywhere. But they couldn't always afford stones. And if you go around, what you'll see is a fair amount of these older stones are government issue stones. So when you, if you're a veteran, the government will send a stone for your grave. Am I correct, Dave? Any veteran? And so what you'll see is that all these government stones around here, those are all black Civil War soldiers, which is a whole story in its own we're not going to cover. But now where this lantern is, is the Masons. So the Masons is a, a black family. They came here in 1848, a mother, two sons, and a daughter. The father, the mother was a free black in Virginia. Virginia changed the law. Basically, they didn't have free blacks. 
and after a certain period. So what happened was her husband was a slave. This is family history. We've not been in, this has not been documented. But family history says he was a slave. They gained his freedom, and they didn't get out of Virginia quick enough, and he got sold down the river. So down the river means sent to the deep south. They never saw him again. We don't know really anything about him. We just know that that's family story. Uh, the first veteran was Theodore. Theodore died in the Civil War. There was another brother, John or Joseph. I'm not going to pull my thing out to see which one it is. He had several sons, but uh, from his line, his, several of his sons were in uh, World War One. There are 22 veterans in that family through Vietnam. So the first veteran is Noble Byron Mason the first. Noble Mason was in the uh, 354th Wagon Service Corps. Service Corps is World War One speak for Black Unit. They were service units, so they didn't. They did fight some, but for the most part. They dug ditches, they drove wagons, they did stuff like that. Noble never did get a driver's license. And people would say, why don't you get a driver's license? He says, I do drive. I drove a wheelbarrow in World War I. So that's the, the black experience in World War I. Civil War is the same way. They dug a lot of trenches. They did a lot of stuff like that, but they very rarely fought. And they mostly were laborers. So we moved to World War II, Theodore, you remember there was Theodore that died in the Civil War. Theodore, so Noble Mason had seven kids, six boys, or nine kids, eight boys, every boy was a veteran. Several were in World War II, several were in the inner war, and one was in Korea. One of his boys, Theodore, was a Tuskegee Airman. So, two of those boys, including Theodore, went on to become, two of them became dentists and one of them became a painted pediatrician. They're part of the, you know, you hear about the Great Migration, how the southern blacks moved up north to get jobs. Well, that happened here, too. At the, in 1950, 40, 40 census, we were probably 18% black. By the 60s, we were about eight. And the reason was, Although these miners will tell you, oh, we had a black guy. They had a black guy. There were 2,000 miners. So the mines were segregated, except there was one over in Hopedale called the Black and White Mine. And that was their actual business name. And they hired blacks and Italians, which back in, in the 20s and 30s, Italians weren't actually considered white. That's a, you know, that's a relatively, you know, Italians being white people is kind of a, a new thing. Back in the 20s, they were considered black. So, at any rate, so Theodore was a Tuskegee Airman. The Tuskegee Airman, there were no, there was one black pilot in World War I. He, he uh, was an American pilot, but he flew for France. The Tuskegee Airman, uh, there was a law in 1939 that funded black pilots. It was kind of, they dragged their feet until Eleanor Roosevelt climbed in the, the second cockpit and flew as a black pilot. So although that angered a large portion of the population, it also spurred the Tuskegee Airmen to be formed and trained. He was a twin engine pilot. These guys were uh, primarily, um, what's the word I'm looking for, Dave? Cover? Escort. They're primarily escort pilots, and they had such a reputation. At one point, their uh, return rate for bombers was 100%. And bombers, pilots decided, okay, we want these guys to be our escort. So... The, he was a Tuskegee Airman. He just he died not too long ago, actually, like four or five years ago. 
Two of his brothers are still living. One's 97, one's 92. And then we get into Vietnam. There are three uh, Vietnam War vets. One of them is Noble Byron Mason III. So Noble Byron Mason was in a combat unit, infantry unit in Vietnam, came home in 1967, wandering around Caddis, couldn't eat in any of the restaurants because the restaurants were segregated at the time. The uh, movie theater blacks had to sit on the top floor. They weren't allowed to sit on the main floor. And he and three friends, Everett White, uh, the other names, it's in the, it's in the pamphlet, were just kind of lost, disenchanted. Went down south, went to Atlanta, hung out in Atlanta, went to Miami, and on a whim, they hijacked the plane to Cuba. <laughs> It was literally a whim. When you read what the guy wrote, he was like, yeah, one day we just decided we were going to hide there playing games. <laughs> so, as crazy as that sounds, in 1967 and 1968, there were 56 planes hijacked to Cuba. <laughs> this is not a rare occurrence. And many of them, Black Panthers, black people, they thought this communist would be a utopia. So these three guys from Caddis get to Cuba, they're promptly arrested, convicted of being CIA spies, and worked hard labor in the sugarcane fields for 10 years. Yeah, 10 years. The one mother, and I, I think it was no, Noble, they called him Byron, I think it was Byron's mother, fought and fought and fought and fought and fought, and they were finally released, brought back to the United States and convicted of hijacking. <laughs> so, but they all received, their sentence was time served. They've all passed away, Noble passed away in 21. Uh, I never get, did get to talk to him, but he did pass away in 21. And they obviously regretted their choice. Cuba was not the utopia they thought it would be. Uh, and they actually did, like I say, spent 10 years to hard labor. So behind the tree down there is Archie Jackson. We lost uh, two soldiers in Korea. Matthew Simpson of Ohio, Archie Jackson of Caddis. They were both black men and they both died on the same day. In different wars, for different units, different zones actually. So, Archie, and my, my brain just left me, was in the 24th Infantry Regiment, it was called the Double Deuces. The 24th Infantry Regiment was America's last segregated unit. In 1948, President Truman ordered all units to be desegregated. All units were desegregated except one unit commanded by a guy in uh, Texas, he just simply refused to do it. So they sent this unit to um, Korea, combat units of Korea, all black men. They're all white officers who rotated out every three months. Dave's here as a veteran, he will tell you if you're, if you're combat unit, and your leadership changes every three months, you're just not going to have a whole lot. These guys knew they were only going to be there 90 days, so they didn't do much. They got the worst equipment. When they needed people, and this is documented, they actually pulled people out of the mental wards and sent them to this unit. Deserters, pulled them out of jail, sent them to this unit. Game more War one issue, weapons, it was unbelievable. They basically set them up to fail is what they did. In 19, September of 1950, uh, General Kern recommended they be disbanded, and they were called the yellow, the yellow bats, meaning they would run. And so they had no training, no weapons. Some of them couldn't even load their own gun. That's how poorly trained they were. 
So this is the unit that Archie Jackson was in. They were set up for failure, set up to prove that black men couldn't fight. And they weren't disbanded a year later, but it took them a year to disband it. They received um, very negative from their higher ups. It just went on and on and on and on and on. So Archie was at a bridgehead during the fourth battle of Seoul. And he was in a Jeep and he was killed on a bridge in on the in the battle of Seoul. And the US Army did not correct their history until nineteen ninety eight. They, 1998, they finally rewrote the history of that unit and put all the responsibility for their failures on the men who led them and not the men who were in them. But it took 50 years. But it's done. So that is Archie Jackson. He was very well liked. Um, one of his friends was, he just passed away not too long ago. He's a friend of mine. Told great stories about him, told how devastated he was when he found out he was killed. Uh, he was, his name was Tom Adams. He was a former gunner and he, he, he was a uh, gun sighter. I don't know what they call those guys, but he would go out in front of the big guns or what? Forward observer. So I asked him, I said, what did you do in the war? He said, I didn't do much. He said, I just looked through my binoculars. He said, if their bomb wasn't going right spot, I told him to move it. <laughs> okay, well, you know, sounds like you did a lot to me. You're not that far away from the front if you can see where these bombs are landing. But that is very typical. He was a very modest man. So the next stone over there is uh, Henry Wallace's stone. And we're going to credit Jim Dowdle with this story. So... There's probably a half dozen of these. They're cast. They're not me they're metal. And they're hollow. So what they would do is cast these. And then when you ordered one, they would just make a nameplate to go in. So they're hollow in the center. And during Prohibition, that was a pickup spot. <laughs> Obviously, we can't document that, but it makes a great story. So I think... You guys want to walk up to that land, or do you just want to keep talking from here? Why don't I keep talking from here? So there's a land up there, Melford J. Brown, M.J. Brown. About 1866, he was sleeping. His house was the house that was torn down to build matter tire, that red house there. He was cashier of the Harris National Bank. I'll talk fast. <laughs> Jamie, you better get over here. Your, your finger's getting rained on. So, uh... He was cashier. Six men tried to rob a bank in Wellsburg. Tried to rob a bank in Wellsburg. They, it, they were a failure. They heard Caddis was a rich little town, so they came to Caddis. They did some reconnaissance. Five of them came to town. They tied up him and his wife. And one of them stood guard. And the other four went to the bank. Now the bank was that red brick, or was it red? It was that brick building that just tore down in Caddis, coming down the hill towards the library. Back, this was before there were combination locks. These were padlocks, padlock. So they went down, they were able to pick the door lock, get in, overpower the night watchman, use the key they got off of Brown. They threatened Brown's life, and his wife gave him the key. They unlocked it. <laughs> They got away with $250,000. Now, there is, there is, they used to say Caddis had the highest per capita deposit rate in the country. And if you think about 14,000, 18,000 people back in, $250,000, some of it was bonds, some of it was cash, it was about $5,000 in coin. They went, uh, they threw the coin in a pig pen out uh, basically where Rite Aid is. That was all farm back in. They made it out to about where the gas plant is, and there was a little shanty there with a hand car. 
They put the hand car on, and oh, I forgot. So Wallace is, they stole his watch and an apple pie. <laughs> and the apple pie is important. So this was at two in the morning. His uh, servant, maid, whatever you want to call her, shows up for work, get everything ready about 5.30, realizes, where's this apple pie? I thought, why is this apple pie missing? She said, there might, there might be something wrong, and she found them. Otherwise, she'd let them sleep for another hour. The arm was raised. Now, these guys have been pumping since 3 o'clock in the morning. They are down to ghouls. I don't know if you guys know where ghouls is, but yeah. ghouls is New, New Alexandria, down at the bottom of the hill in New Alexandria, down and it's a deep, it's a steep hill. There was a train station, they called it Alexandra Station. They were unable to cut the telegraph line, so they went, they pitched the uh, cart over the hill there, and they went around around the station because they thought there would be a trap for them, and there was. So they'd eaten the apple pie at some point. Um, and there was one guy who was, and we, all, we know this story because one of the perpetrators, a guy named George White, wrote a book called From Boniface to Bank Burger. So he wanted them to go through the woods. This one guy went right through the field, and sure enough, they followed the muddy tracks. They got around the Alexander Station, were heading to Mingo, and the thing got left the muddy tracks, got hungry, and stole the chicken. <laughs> And a young man saw him steal the chicken. Told his dad. They went out, saw these people. And it's like, what's up? Well, we have bank robbers. Oh, we had somebody steal the chicken. So they had gotten not too far, another half mile, three quarter mile, found an old abandoned cabin, cooked the chicken, ate the chicken. George White the whole time is like, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go. So they divided up the money. His was forty some thousand dollars. They went a little further, sat down, they were in a ravine, and the posse caught up to him. And they scattered. Mr. White ran through shrubs, bushes, came on an abandoned coal mine. Now, if you took a look at the coal mines that they dug out up here by the tractor supply, they were about three feet high. That was a coal mine. It was full of water, but it had an airspace. He got in that airspace on his back, went back into the coal mine, it opened up, and he was able to sit on a rock with his money. But actually, no, he, he had buried his money right outside the coal mine. So there was another guy who had escaped as well. The four were caught, the one escaped. The other guy that escaped, as he says in his book, he was the best lock picker in the country when he wasn't on the dope. So he was probably a heroin addict, which was not an uncommon thing in post-Civil War times. So at any rate, um, Mr. White crawls out a day later, makes his way to Steubenville, he lost his hat. And he's all worried about this hat, because the guy without a hat is obviously up to no good. So he comes upon a worker, he gives him 50 cents for a nickel hat. Goes into Steubenville, buys a good hat. He's got some of his money, he buried the rest of it out, out by this train trestle. Gets out of town, comes back two weeks later, gets his money, goes and becomes a, a, another, a still a bank robber, but he also had some legitimate businesses in New York City. Three years later, one of his compatriots, sister got a hold of him. His compatriot had figured out a way to get out of the penitentiary. He was sentenced to 14 years, so he went, uh, he went back to the sister, they paid off a uh, supplier, the supplier put him in an apple barrel, empty apple barrel, brought him out, they went over to New York, continued robbing banks, that guy got caught, spent five years in Connecticut, shipped back to Ohio, spent the rest of his 14 years, Mr. White was never arrested, and we found out the rest of the story in 1905 when he wrote the book. <laughs> Alright guys, it's raining, thank you. I will entertain quick questions. I know it's raining, but if anybody has a question, if not, we're out of here and I'm fine with that. Thanks for coming.